then, well, if you could see us, <laughs> we've got a room full of 26 eighth graders here at O'Neill High School. Um, okay. We've been learning a lot about writing all year long. The focus of this English class is on writing, and um, we're particularly involved right now with persuasive writing. We just finished up a big unit for the statewide writing assessment on descriptive writing, and then we switched gears into using our, um, our writing skills to uh, leave an impact on people, get them to change their minds or agree with our opinions or understand what we're thinking, so a persuasive yeah. focus. So we're excited yeah. to hear from you and your experience at the Norfolk Daily News, so I'll let you uh, take it over. So is there a part of the statewide assessment that deals with persuasive writing, or is it really just descriptive? It's just descriptive in 8th grade, and then when they get to be, they, they test it 4th, 8th, and 11th grade in the state of Nebraska, and in 11th grade, the focus is persuasive. So Okay, okay. Well, great. Well, I am very happy to be with you guys this morning. Since at, at this moment, since I can't see you, if there comes a time when we're talking and you have a question or something I said that doesn't make sense, you know, just interrupt me because uh, I can obviously hear you uh, okay. and things like that. But I'll just start rolling, you know, and things like that, and, and we'll go from there. But by all means, um, if you have questions or, or some things that you I don't make sense with, uh, by all means, interrupt me. Me and things like that. I think it's great that you're doing a session or spending some time with per persuasive writing. I think that's a, uh, in many respects a, a very important skill that you will use regardless of what career you go into after school, after college, or, or your first job and things like that. Um, whether it's dealing with co-workers, uh, whether it's dealing with your boss, whether it's dealing with family members, whether it's just dealing with people um, in your neighborhood, in your church, in your community, uh, there are times when you certainly have strong feelings about uh, one issue or another, and the more effective you can be in sharing that your opinion with others, uh, the better off you'll be. So this is, uh, I think, very valuable for you all. Um, if memory serves me correctly, and, and uh, your teacher can, can correct me if I'm wrong. I think last year, after we had this session, some of you, uh, some of the eighth graders from last year sent me uh, some of the samples of what they, what they were writing, and we published them in the Daily News. And I would certainly extend that same invitation again this year if that's something that, that you and your uh, the class w would be interested in. That is correct, and we're hoping that some of these guys indeed uh, submit some letters to the Norfolk Daily News and see if they can get them published as well. So. Good, good. Did last year or this year, or do you do you, do you send anything to like the Holt County paper in Ohio? Yeah, yes, we did. We let the, the students choose which newspaper they wanted to um, try to get published in. Um, some even tried for the New York Times <laughs> and the Omaha World Herald, uh, but we, we only did get published in the Holt County Independent and the Norfolk Daily News. But um, Well, never just to shoot high. That's you know, right, that's County. right. And, Things like that. I suspect the New York Times gets quite a few letters in any given day, more than I do, and so the competition may be a little harder uh, right. in that respect. So anyway, okay, we'll talk about um, some some ideas about how to, to be effective in persuasive writing. You know, uh, there there are some individuals. Let's take your teachers for example. You may respect them well enough that if they came to you and said, "Here's what I believe about." whatever issue and things like that. You may respect them enough that you're going to agree with their opinion simply because of who they are and the respect you have for them. But in most cases, it's not enough just to say what your opinion is. You have to back it up with, with why you believe that way and what, re what facts, what, what reasons, what, what opinions you have in hopes of, of convincing and persuading others uh, to follow along with your viewpoint. So uh, it may come to the point where you, you are highly regarded enough by others that you can simply say, here's what I believe, and you don't have to explain it. But the reality is, is probably you need to explain it, and that's the key uh, in dealing with people. It's having good explanations and good, good facts and suppositions to base your opinion on in that respect. Hopefully that makes sense. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll assume yes. that it does. Yes. We, I mentioned the words convince and persuade. Um, I can't see you, but does it, does, what do you think of those two words? you think they're the, do they mean the same thing? Very close. 
Pretty What's the difference, do you think? Between convince and persuade. Who's got a guess? The difference between convince and persuade. This group's not <laughs> it, it's, it's, it's a very subtle difference, and it's really just one of those little uh, uh, tricks of the language. If, you're, if you want to convince someone, you're convincing them of something. If you're persuading someone, you're persuading them to do something. Okay. So when you persuade, you're, con you're, you're hoping that they will take action. Like okay. they will vote for a particular candidate, or they will go out and sign a petition on an issue, or they will uh, you'll persuade them to run for the school board. If you're convincing them, you're convincing them of something. It doesn't require any action. It's just simply convincing them of the merits of your argument on whatever, whatever issue you're talking about. And the only reason I bring that up, because you're right, really, they, they almost mean the same thing, is that... In many of you, the letters that you may be writing, and in many of the persuasive things that you may be writing, you have you may be wanting to get do both: convince them of something, and, and in many cases, persuade them to do something. Also, it's one thing to simply get them to agree with your opinion. It's all the more effective if you can then get them to other people to act on that opinion and actually take action on it. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Good. Now, I'm hoping, uh, I had a handout that we put together last yes. year when we did this for the first time with, for, for the 8th grade class. Yes. Do you have that in front of you? Yes. yes. You all have that. Okay. Yes. We're just going to go down, down that point by point, and I'll elaborate a little bit on some of those and, and, and things like that. Some of these are more important than others, but I think if you have a, uh, a handle on what the handout says, you're going to be all the more effective in dealing with your persuasive writing. So, let's start at the top. First bullet point. Your goal should be to write to be understood, not to impress. Sometimes, I think in a classroom situation, or even in real life situations, you people fall are guilty of trying to impress someone with what they say. Um, I think you impress people simply by writing clearly and, and making sure your opinions are, are easily understandable. So, it's, again, it's a subtle difference, but your goal should be to make sure that the people who are reading whatever you're writing understand what you have to say. Not that they're impressed with your language or the, or the flowery adjectives you use or things like that. You want people to understand what you have to say. And, Ken, um, I think that's a difference between what we did with the, pers the descriptive writing, the state assessment, where we did try to be flowery and um, um, that, you know, we I use agree. more of that. Now, here where we're doing this persuasive writing, I agree. Keeping it simple and making sure people understand what we're writing is more important than trying yep. to impress them. Yep, exactly. You know, uh, it says, don't say, quote, proper <laughs> etiquette and mean good manners. The, the point being is use language that you're comfortable with. Uh, the next point says, write the way you talk. Uh, you use contractions, so write that way, too. In other words... I suspect it's probably true that, that when you're writing an essay for a, for a classroom assignment or things like that, part of your thinking is, oh, I want to impress my teacher. I better throw in some big words, right. uh, uh, all that kind of stuff. There's nothing wrong with big words, but you have to remember that not everyone who reads what you're writing is going to necessarily have the same vocabulary you are, or they didn't look it up in the dictionary or thesaurus and things like that. So if you're saying this that it's important to write clearly, concisely, and in language that you all are comfortable with uh, in that regard. You can be uh, highly effective in making a point without using $3,000 words uh, in that respect. Just, you know, write the way you talk. That, that's, the, that's the most important thing. We talk about keeping your paragraphs short. You know, writing short, concise paragraphs is a good habit to get to. And as easy as it seems. Uh, if I would uh, say that when I see some English essays in a class, uh, we have a lot of run on sentences. Uh, the one, uh, <laughs> in that area. I think I was talking about just writing in short, concise paragraphs. Um, you know, yes. it, it's, it's, a, it, it's, 
it, it sounds easier than, than it can be and sometimes because I think a lot of our upbringing uh, in, in school situations often lend themselves, like the descriptive writing you just got, got, just got done with, to more longer, more uh, sentences with lots of clauses and, and subjunctive phrases and things like that. So, so uh, when you're trying to persuade, I think shorter, concise is always better. Uh, the same thing with words. Prefer the familiar words to unfamiliar ones. Uh, the, the test should be simply this. If you're writing a word and you don't really understand it, you know, or you had to look it up in a dictionary and the de definition sounds right, you're not still 100% sure if it's the proper word, then don't use it. Uh, just if, if you're not sure of it, if, if there's any possibility of um, confusion, misperception, uh, or someone taking wrong, don't go with the the uh, the, it's the fancy word. Go with the fancy word. Uh, vary your sentence length. So don't be afraid to use an eight-word sentence. Don't be a, do be afraid of any sentences that are more than thirty words long. Mix up the short, the medium, and the long sentences together. If you look at that handout in front of you, uh, you will see, I, I believe, that, that most of the sentences on that handout are 10 words or less. Mm -hmm. There's a few that are longer, but it's really uh, a good example of short, concise sentences, short, concise paragraphs. Uh, and hopefully, uh, when you read it, it's, it's been very understandable and makes sense to you, and that there's nothing in there where I'm using words that are not part of your vocabulary. And that's the most important thing is, is I'm trying to be persuasive to you all this morning in your class on how best to do persuasive writing. And I'm going to be the most effective if I can relate to you in terms of language that you understand and that makes sense to you. Does that make sense? Yes. Yep. Okay. Good. Okay. Uh, now we get down to some more uh, things about in terms of what you're writing and how you're writing it. Um, I suspect in your class, um, your, your, your instructors often make you uh, put together an outline or do a first draft uh, before you actually turn in a finished assignment. Um, with, a, with a letter to the editor or some other piece of persuasive writing, I don't necessarily know that you always have to go to all those kind of steps and, and things like that, but you certainly have to uh, you sit down at the computer or your tablet or however you're writing it. You don't want to just, you want to think about what you're going to say before you start writing. Don't just start typing because you sort of have a general idea of the topic and things like that. Uh, what you'll end up with is, is a few introductory sentences that don't really add anything uh, to the persuasiveness of your argument. It's just sort of, I'm writing today because I want to try and convince you uh, that uh, I don't know, abortion is bad or that President Obama uh, is a good president. You know? You just wasted a sentence. Uh, you know, get right into it to begin with. So organize what you, what you think you want to say. Think about it. Um, when I go out and cover a news story uh, and do an interview with whomever, as I'm driving back to the office, uh, I'm already thinking about how the story is going to play out. What my lead, my first few sentences is going to be. How I'm going to flow to a different point and how I'm going to finish it up. So when I get back to the office and sit down at the computer, I sort of know what I'm going to say already uh, in that regard. It, it just takes some practice. It takes some discipline on your part. But if you can think about what you want to write before you write, uh, that's great. And if it takes making a simple outline, great um, uh, in that regard. Um, and, and don't feel like it has to be something overly complicated or overly lengthy or things like that. Sometimes the most pers the, the most effective persuasive writing is simply when you don't try to make 3,000 different points, but you focus on two that, the, that are the most important to you and really hit them hard. Okay? Sure. Uh, the next two bullets, be accurate when stating facts and don't mix facts with opinions. The be accurate, be accurate when stating facts should be obvious to you. Uh, there's nothing that you were talking about being accurate when stating facts, so I don't yeah, know how right. long we were yeah. off uh, before you realized. There's, there's nothing more uh, damaging to your persuasive argument than if you have a, a great, let's say, letter to the editor, uh, mm -hmm. and all of a sudden there's, there's a fact that's incorrect, you know, something that, right. that sh 
you know, it, it, it sh is something that the, the average person might know. Because then all of a sudden, if they say, well, wait a minute, he or she's wrong about this, uh, maybe they're wrong about everything else. Why should right. I believe them? So the, the facts just, uh, top of the, the list, you know, have to have your facts straight uh, in, in that regard. If you're not sure about a fact, then offer it as an opinion. Don't present it as a fact. Mm -hmm. The full the point that talks about the examples of, you know, if you wrote President Jones is the worst president ever in the history of the United States. Okay, you're presenting that sentence as a fact. Can you prove that? I doubt it. No. Uh, I think you can easily go say, I believe President Jones is the worst president ever in the history of the United States. A lot of letters I get present opinions as facts. They say, you know, uh, so and so is terrible, or 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 this is the right, this this is the way it has to be, or things like that. And they're not presenting it with that caveat of it's my opinion, or I believe, or I think. Uh, in that regard, you have to be really careful about that because there are certainly going to be people who disagree with your opinions, and if you're presenting them as fact instead of opinion, uh, you're really going to lose them. If you at least offer them as an opinion, most people are reasonable enough to, to say, well, I may not agree with them, but he or she has a right to their own opinion, and so I respect that. Uh, that that's the, the real key. Watch how you, you uh, couch the language that you use when you're trying to make it a point in, uh, in that regard. Um, for example, uh, you know, it's, I don't know if, if this is, uh, uh, all that pertinent or not, but I'll, I'll throw it out as, as a possibility. We, we talked earlier about the difference between convince and persuade, right? Mm -hmm. What's the difference, if there is, between more and most? Most, you have, like, a lot, like, the, the amount, like, like all you're, like, yeah, you're all absolute, right? Yeah, yeah. 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 you have the absolute most value in it. More, more is just you have a, a little like bit. Yeah, if you have more. Than you have the most. You have yeah. more. Uh huh. Yeah. Okay. That that all makes sense. But 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 here's the real key. Here's the real key. When you use the word most, what you are really saying is that you can prove that more than fifty percent of people uh, feel that way. Most implies a majority. So unless you've taken a survey, for example, of all your high school students. You better not say most O'Neill High School students believe uh, that the Eagles will win the state wrestling uh, title this weekend. Well, we do. Uh, <laughs> well, uh, Just kidding. Believe that. Uh, I mean, uh, you know, unless you can prove it, right. that, it's, that it's more than 50%, the safer word is more. Uh -huh. Because more just means a lot. Uh -huh. And that's always fairly safe to say. So you, you, there, there's little intricacies with the language that you have to worry about that some people really pay attention to. I really hate it when I see most in most letters to the editor because, except on extremely rare occasions, is, is most properly used because I know that they don't, they, they have no way of knowing that they've surveyed the entire group of people they're talking about and that at least 51% of them agree with them. It right. just doesn't happen. Right. So you have to be careful. Uh, now we're getting into proofread. Uh, my suggestion is this. You try doing it twice. Once you sort of read it out loud to yourself to see how it sounds. I think that's one of the best ways of, of doing that. For any of you who might be involved in speech or will be involved in speech when you get older uh, as a freshman or sophomore, things like that, you can write a great speech, but until you say it out loud, you don't really know how it sounds. And so I think it's important to to try and read it to yourself. You know, it doesn't have to be really out loud. You can just sort of say the words to yourself and things like that. And then look at each individual word because it's all easy. I know in my business, in the newspaper business, I can sort of read through a story and I read through it carefully and I still miss something. And so you also have to really look for each word because all of a sudden there's two thes right, right next to each other and uh, when you're reading it for content, you can skim over those two thuds really easily, uh, things like that. So sometimes what I do is we read it from the bottom to the front. And when you're reading it to the bottom to the front, you really have to be deliberate about it 
and that helps you realize where you whether you've got an extra word in there or you've forgotten a word or there's a wrong word and things like that it, it takes a little time um, but I think if your goal is to have as, as a professional of a persuasive piece as possible I think it's well worth the time uh, and while you're looking at you know proofreading is editing is another proofreading you're looking for you know specific little grammatical or hyphenation errors or things like that editing is more for the content and things like that I suspect that after you've written your letter um, or persuasive piece or what have you that you could go back and read it uh, and there's probably sentences or words that could be eliminated because they're they're duplicative uh, they don't really add to the point you're trying to make they're really just sort of filler material, or you're repeating yourself. Uh, I'm not a big fan of at a letter at the end of a letter to the editor saying, "So in summary, I, I believe such and such." Mm -hmm. Well, if you haven't told people what you believe by that time, you probably haven't written a very good letter. Mm -hmm. So you can watch things that you can need to edit for and, and things like that. Uh, I talk about write with feeling, edit with reason. You certainly want to be passionate about what you're writing about. Uh, if you're trying to persuade someone, it certainly implies that you feel strongly about what you're writing. <laughs> We're down to the last two bullet points of that handout. Uh, <laughs> and they're very important. Yes. Uh, you know, three quarters of the trick in writing opinion pieces is picking the right subject. We yes. talked about writing with passion. Right. Um, just don't go through the motions. Uh, really feel something that you're strongly, uh, that you feel strongly about. I suspect that if you try to fake it, you know, if, if it's an issue that you don't really care about and you try to make it sound like you do, it's gonna gonna come across looking like you faked it. Right. So you really want to feel something, write about something that you feel strongly about because that really does shine through. I think that's that's important. Um, uh, so take um, take the time necessary uh, to give some thought to what you really want to write about. Uh, something that uh, is important to you, you know, that really matters in that regard. Right. But then when you're when you're doing that, it's awful easy because we see we hear this, you know, on talk radio and oh, you know, ESPN and Sports Center, you know, things like that. It's awful easy to get personal uh, and get mean spirited uh, and things like that. Um, and I don't think that accomplishes anything. Uh, What's important is for you to be able to make your point, even if you're disagreeing strongly with someone else, um, but not do so in a way that you're personally attacking anyone. You can criticize someone or something without being nasty about it. If we were having the discussion, this discussion instead of a classroom, if we were sitting in the church that you might belong to, we talk about the Bible verse that says, speak the truth with love. You know, you're expressing your opinion. You're expressing the truth as you see it. But you're doing so in a kind way, uh, in a loving way. Uh, that doesn't mean you have to water down your opinions. That doesn't mean you have to hold back. Uh, but you don't get personal about it, um, and you don't get nasty. You don't call, call people names. Mm -hmm. You don't say President Obama is so dumb. Uh, you know things like that. You 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 find a way to make your point without being personal. Uh, and if you do that your point will be all the more effective. So those last two things, I think, are probably as important as anything as you're uh, dealing with persuasive writing is to, to pick the right subject and take care to make sure that, that you express your opinions without delving into some sort of a personal tirade against someone, even though you may feel like you want to do a personal tirade. Um, right. It's not going to serve you well in the long run. Okay, Very so I've been through the handouts, and even though I can't see you, do we have time for you questions? Yeah, I don't let's, know what time let's try for a few, you. and I'll just kind of call out names, and you guys can yell out your question, okay? Okay. So we'll take um, a question from Shelby first, and then you guys be ready to jump in with another one. Um, what topics do you get most letters about? Oh, um, I would say most of the letters I get are... Uh, uh, deal with politics, um, whether it's local politics, state politics, national politics, and things like that. People around here, generally speaking, are politically conservative, and so there's a, a fair number of letters that we get that criticizing 
the Obama administration, definitely getting a lot of letters about uh, federal health care reform, Obamacare and its implication, things like that. Uh, uh, a book and pro life issues are important to a lot of people in this part of the state, so we get a lot of letters on that. Um, so, general like, politics and issues related to politics. Okay. Thanks. Another question, eighth graders? What? Does writing ever seem to get old or seem boring to you? Oh, certainly there are times when, you know, uh, you're not all that interested in a story that, that you have to write. Uh, maybe, it's a, maybe it's a political candidate that you've already interviewed three times earlier uh, while they're campaigning, and you think, boy, what new can he or she say? Things like that. Uh -huh. So there are some stories that you, that, uh, uh, you really have to um, guard against simply mailing it in and going through the motions and really try to do the best job possible, even though it's not high in your your list in terms of the most exciting or, or interesting stories to do. Uh, that just sort of goes to the territory when you work for a newspaper and you write for a living. Uh, not everything is going to be um, uh, the most exciting thing uh, to, to have to deal with. How do you deal with writer's block? With newspaper writers, I mean, we have deadlines each day. Uh -huh. and, uh, you know, it's not like each story is a masterpiece sure. or a novel or things like that. And so, really, writer's block doesn't get to be a real problem for newspaper just because of the nature of our Sure. That makes sense. And we're going to okay. have Michaela ask it. How did you get to where you are today? Um, I grew up in Plainview, Nebraska. Okay. My dad ran the weekly newspaper there, so I, I worked for him going up, growing up in, you know, in junior high and high school, things like that. And I realized that writing came easy to me, and I liked doing it. So I went to the University of Nebraska uh, and majored in journalism and political science there. And then I worked for the World Herald for five years after college, uh, doing a variety of copy editing and editorial writing and reporting. And then about 26 years ago, I moved to Norfolk to become the, the editor of the paper, and I've been here ever since. Uh, this is the size of town and the size of, of newspaper that really fits what I like to do because I feel like I can have a, a greater impact on the community with what we do. Um, Omaha, you have a, a bigger reach, uh, but... Uh, <laughs> North Basically, Omaha, there you're not for smaller. So yeah, but I think what he's saying is you just can't have as much of an impact because it's like you have to write stories for the whole state and you can't talk about really local issues. Yeah. And, and Oh, there you go. Keep going. Okay. Well, that, that's basically it. I mean, uh -huh. uh, you could have a tremendous career and impact working for the whole county independent or the North Carolina uh -huh. News, or uh -huh. the Plainview News, or the World Herald in Omaha, or the papers even larger than that. Right. It really is, it is uh, what fits your personality, what fits your goals best, and things like that. Awesome. Well, we appreciate so much your knowledge and expertise and your time and working through the My technical pleasure. difficulties. Um, you bet. We'll definitely, um, hopefully you'll be hearing from us soon, and um, we're going to play back this recording without all the hiccups, so it'll just seem smooth and flawless here in an hour or so. So <laughs> thanks again so much, Kent. Thank you. My pleasure. Thanks. Thank you. Goodbye.